So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kamini Singer. It's a super pleasure to be here today at uh, GEO Ottawa, and um, I'm super excited to talk with you guys about some things that my research group has been thinking about for the last decade or so. And um, this is a tour, it's an, a year-long tour. I'm giving 81 talks this year, and uh, this is the 64th stop. And, uh, and this is the obligatory slide that I need to show at the beginning of every lecture. And um, for this crew, this is probably kind of an obvious guy, but uh, just in case, I'm supposed to introduce Henry Darcy whom this lecture tour is named after, the famous French civil engineer who, in coming up with filtration systems, water filtration systems for the town of Dijon, gave us the equation at the bottom of this slide, which holds his name, which is Darcy's Law. And all this equation says is that Q, that volumetric rate at which water moves through porous media, is related to DHDL, an energy or a potential gradient. And um, it's pretty hard to talk about the flow of water without invoking Darcy's Law, so this will come up a little later in today's talk. I also need to thank a bunch of people. Um, as part of this lecture tour, um, I am doing a lot of flying, and that is funded by the U.S. National Groundwater Association's foundation, LBG and Woodard and Curran. Um, I also need to thank a bunch of people. Um, I'm about to sort of outline a decade's worth of work, and there's a number of people that have been fundamental to my understanding of these systems. Um, in particular, I'd like to point out a couple folks, uh, Fred Day Lewis and Marty Briggs at the USGS. Um, Mike Gustaf, a colleague of mine from Penn State, who's now at the University of Colorado. Andy Binley at the University of Lancaster. Um, but really importantly, there's three people on this slide I really should highlight. Sean Culkin, Adam Ward, and Ryan Swanson. They were all graduate students working with me, and without them, there would be no exciting data to share. So with that, so um, I'm gonna start today's talk with a lie. And for any of you who've taken a class in contaminant hydrogeology, you probably were told this lie too. Um, which is how stuff moves in the subsurface. And, um, and the reason we care about contaminant transport is for a couple of reasons, one of which is obviously to assess risk, the other is to be able to provide better ways of getting stuff out of the ground. And the lie goes like this. On the left-hand side, you see like a little gray block down there. So we have an aquifer, and when we spill methyl ethyl bad stuff in an aquifer, it transports itself like a surfboard, which is what you are seeing. And the idea would then be, if I have a well and I'm lucky enough to be able to sample that well, then I have a concentration history or a concentration through time plot that is almost Gaussian. It would be Gaussian in space, almost Gaussian in time. And so this is the mathematics that we use to descri describe contaminant transport at lots and lots of sites, but what we know is that this equation doesn't quite work. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. What we know is that the subsurface is highly complex. What that means is that our plumes are really funny shaped. They have little legs that stick off the back, stuff gets stuck. And then our concentration histories aren't almost Gaussian. They have weird things like long tails out the back end and double humps, et cetera. And, um, and so it's hard to make predictions when our, our forward models that allow us to sort of get a sense for a system don't quite handle some of the, the dynamics that we see in the field. Another place we see this is in pump and treat remediation. So for instance, you come on site and you're trying to get some stuff out of the ground, you're gonna pump it, treat it, potentially put it back in the ground or take it away. The idea would be you show up on site, there's a concentration of whatever that is that you wanna remove. Ideally, what you would be able to do is turn on your pump, remove that mass until you get below some standard, whatever's been set for you, turn your pump off and walk away. But what we know happens is when you turn the pump off, we see something else. What we end up seeing in countless sites is a rebound in concentration. And the problem with this is this, again, is something that's hard for us to predict with standard models. And this is problematic because not only are you back above your standard again, so you have to go back in, put your pumps back in, try to remove that mass. Um, you know, that's, that's costly in terms of both your time um, and just you know, dollars in general. So I have statistics for the US, I'm not Canada, I apologize, but hopefully we're better at contaminating things than you are. There are about 300,000 groundwater contaminated sites in the US alone. So it's just one country. And the total cost to clean those are on the order of a hundred billion to a trillion dollars. And to be honest, that's so many zeros that I don't even know what to do with that. But if I told you that it's a million dollars an hour for the next hundred years, you get a sense of how big this problem is. And that's just for one country. And the problem, the reason these numbers are so high is in part because we don't have the right models to make those predictions. And so there's lots of people thinking about that right now. So I wanna start this talk with a story. And um, I wanna tell you about a, a field site 
in the northeast corner of Mississippi, near Alabama and the southeastern United States. And uh, this is the macro dispersion experiment site. It was started as a research site to study dispersion, the idea of how stuff spreads, how solutes spread on the subsurface. And, um, and what I'm showing you is data sets from a tritium tracer test collected from a whole series of multi-level sampling wells, so many different locations where we could sample concentration um, of, that, of that tritium about a year after it was injected. And tritium is something that's conservative, meaning it should just move with groundwater, not reacting, sorbing, other things. And, um, and what you see in that, that isosurface at the top is that a lot of that mass, that, that orange area there, is pretty close to the injection location. And in fact, if we calculate the mass, since we know the concentration, we can get an estimate of the support volume. We can estimate the mass, which is what's in the lower plot. What you see is exactly that. Like most of that mass is sitting right there. That does not look like something that is almost Gaussian in space or time. And, um, and so you might think, well, maybe they just got really unlucky, right? When they went to inject that tritium, they injected it into a block of low permeability material, and the stuff just sat there until it had the chance to migrate past that low permeability block and then migrate down gradients. And that would be a pretty good description for what's happening here, except they didn't tell you a really key thing, which is about how much mass was in the system. So at early time, when they estimated the amount of mass that they injected, and they know this is a controlled experiment, at early time, they found that they calculated too much mass in the aquifer, which is problematic, right? It would be awesome if we could bury stuff and get more back out, but it doesn't work that way, right? So there's a problem here in that we're estimating too much mass. At late time, they estimated too little mass, and that is no problem. We are super good at losing stuff in the subsurface. But it was the too much mass part that was particularly problematic. So this led the group of scientists who were working on this to think about another model to describe solute transport in the system. So rather than just having this aquifer and that sort of almost Gaussian concentration history they were talking about, that we were talking about before, um, what they did is they broke up the aquifer into two different porosities, a mobile and a less mobile porosity. Now, you may already be thinking that, like, well, I, I think there should be more types of porosity. A petroleum engineer once told me there are five types of immobile, mobile porosity, and that is great. We can have as many types of immobile porosity as you want, but for today's talk, just for right now, we're going to have two, and we can talk about um, there being more than that in a moment. So if we have a connected porosity through which advection dispersion happens and a less well-connected porosity, that would mean that we'd have two concentration histories that we would like to track, one for that connected pore space and one for that less connected pore space. And that model has been known as a dual domain mass transfer model or mobile and mobile model. These have existed for some time. Now, I should point out that this type of model isn't new. People have known about this for a long time. This is an image from Coates and Smith from 1964 showing exactly this idea that there are connected porosities and less well-connected porosities in the subsurface. They called them stagnant pores. You can call them whatever you want. Stuff that doesn't move as quickly as other parts of the aquifer. So the idea was coming back to that field site in Mississippi is let's take that block of material that's shown there to be our aquifer and we're going to inject that tritium and what you're going to do is drop a piezometer, drop a well into that aquifer and that blue area is going to be that well connected pore space in, in this schematic that I'm showing you here. So the idea would be if you have a piezometer and you are sampling in that blue pore space, you sample a certain concentration of tritium and if you applied that concentration to that entire volume that's there, you would estimate too much mass because there's a bunch of that porosity, all the stuff that's white, where the tritium hasn't yet gotten. So that would be one way of estimating too much mass. And then at late time, if we came back and you sampled that, that area, the mobile pore space again, because what we sample with our piezometers is typically the stuff that's mobile, the stuff that can move easily, the stuff that's stuck in less mobile pore space or sorbed or whatever is the stuff that's hard to get out of the aquifer. So we come in, we put that well back into the pore space. Now you measure nothing. Right? You're in that white pore space, it seems clean, the tritium has migrated past, but we know that tritium is stuck in that red area, that it has moved into that less mobile pore space and it isn't moving. And so with that, you would estimate a mass that is lower than what's actually in the aquifer. So the thing is that this is just a, a hypothesis, right? This idea of dual domain mass transfer, the idea of getting stuff stuck in less mobile pore space. And so we'd ultimately like to be able to test that. The problem is that the traditional measurements that we make as hydrogeologists tend to um, measure that mobile piece, as we were just talking about. And also, there's a lot of other processes that might control transport. So today's talk is mostly going to be about the top bullet here, this idea of diffusion in and out of less mobile pore space. But other things may be able to create some of the same behaviors, those long tails, a bit on the rebounds that we were talking about. 
even just having fast flow paths and slope flow paths, but also importantly, geochemistry, things sorbing and desorbing off of organic carbon or other minerals, um, you can have precipitation solution reactions, other things. Um, I'm primarily gonna talk about the physical piece of this today, um, but I'm happy to talk about the chemical piece for those that are interested too. So, um, so here's, here's my favorite equation. Um, this is the advection dispersion equation. For those of you that are hydrogeologists, you've probably seen this a lot. For those of you who haven't, this is the equation that we use to predict the movement of contaminants in the subsurface or solutes um, for things that aren't reacting. And it's a super interesting equation. If we look at the left-hand side of that equation, all it says is that if I wanna predict concentration through time, I need to know two things, which are both on the right-hand side of this equation. I need to understand dispersion and diffusion, how something spreads, and advection, which is controlled by V, the average linear velocity as described by Darcy's law, so how something migrates with the hydraulic head. And so this is the equation that we use, and this is the equation that often doesn't fit the data we have. So there are lots of people working on other models to describe solute transport that move beyond the advection dispersion equation. And um, I'm gonna pick the simplest of these models because what I'm gonna try to do is find a way to measure some of the parameters that are in this, additional, this, this other equation. So here's that mobile to mobile model. And I like this model because it looks just like the advection dispersion equation, except it's got one additional piece. And now the subscripts become important. In that upper equation, all the subscripts had Ms, meaning mobile. So what we're talking about is advection in the mobile pore states, dispersion in the mobile pore states. In the lower equation, we now have that less mobile or immobile component too, because we have two concentration histories, and you see that on the left-hand side of that equation. We've got the mobile part and the less mobile part. So how much solute is in the less mobile part? is a function of the concentrations, both in the mobile and that less mobile component, and also this parameter alpha. So the problem with this equation is that it's got two more unknowns. So I've got an immobile or less mobile porosity that I need to be able to quantify in the field, and also alpha, a mass transfer rate, which describes how quickly stuff can move back and forth between the mobile and less mobile pore states. So alpha looks like diffusion over a length scale squared. If alpha is really big, then stuff can move back and forth quickly between the two domains, and if alpha is really small, stuff moves really slowly. The problem with this latter set of equations is that you know that if you have more parameters in your model, that it's going to fit your data better, right? You've got more things to tweak. And so how do we know that this is truly a better model rather than just having more additional parameters? Also, we have the same amount of data that we had before, which is concentration history. So most of the time we fit the parameters within these models associated with our breakthrough history from field sites. So a question was how to get at some of these additional parameters, how to add other data sets that might help us parse this. I have an undergrad degree in geophysics and I still have a super special place in my heart for these methods and um, today I'm gonna talk about in part my favorite geophysical method, which is electrical resistivity. And the reason I like this method so much is that as a hydrogeologist, it is a, sensitive to things that we care a lot about. So when we measure potentials, voltages in the field, they are related to things like the porosity, the conductivity of that porosity, and the total dissolved solids of that pore space, all of which can be super helpful to us as hydrogeologists. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about this model, or these, these methods as I was thinking about it, was that I wasn't sure that something that is less mobile or immobile from a hydrologic standpoint would not be connected from an electrical standpoint. So is it possible to use a method like this because it would be sensitive to total dissolved solids, meaning everything in the mobile and the less mobile pore space in this case, whereas our piezometers are only sensitive to what's mobile. If that's true, there's some really cool things we might be able to do with the geophysics, and that's how I started down this path. So the way this method works, if you haven't used it before, is basically you are going to think of the Earth as a simple circuit, where you use a battery to drive a current around that circuit, and you're gonna measure a voltage drop between two electrodes, and you're gonna know the current you inject, and from that you can estimate the resistance, where that resistance is the thing that's correlated to porosity, connectivity of porosity, total dissolved solids. And um, if you flash back to your freshman year physics, you probably learned Ohm's law, just V is equal to IR, so if you know the voltage and you know the current, you can estimate the resistance. It's a cool equation because it actually looks just like Darcy's law in continuous form. So the way this works in field setting is you put out a series of electrodes. And by electrodes, I basically just mean rebar. You're gonna put that out on the surface or down a borehole. You're gonna drive a current between two of those electrodes using a car battery and measure the resultant potential between another two electrodes. It's a much more expensive piece of equipment, but that's effectively what it does. And you're gonna make many hundreds or thousands of, of measurements 
of uh, the resistance and convert that to an electrical conductivity and intrinsic property of the material. So the reason we're interested in electrical conductivity type measurements is that bulk conductivity that we're gonna measure with the geophysics, so the thing that averages over the entire aquifer, should be related to the fluid conductivity within the pore space, I'm ignoring surface conductance here, through a formation factor of F. F is just porosity, tortuosity in there. So something that should remain constant through time. So the idea is if we can map a bulk conductivity with our geophysical data, we should be able to infer something about a fluid conductivity. Does total dissolved solids that move through the subsurface, and they should be related to one another in a linear way. Um, that x-axis is a, as a Mac problem, that should be a sigma t. So those two things should be related in a straight line relationship. So let's come back to this model. The whole reason we're talking about geophysics is we've got an equation that we think might better explain things like those long tails and concentration histories, the rebound, um, but we have additional unknown parameters and we're trying to find a data set to help us constrain those things. So, um, so let's see what we can do with that. So I'm gonna take you to a, um, a field site in Charleston, South Carolina, where um, we're gonna look at an aquifer storage and recovery system. So the idea of aquifer storage and recovery, if you haven't worked with it before, is that you're going to inject water during times of surplus and pull it out when you need it. So the idea is storing water subsurface um, for, for later use. And the reason to put it in the ground is just that you don't have to have the evaporative losses from surface storage. You also don't have to build surface storage. Now, there's a lot of interesting questions about ASR in terms of what happens um, within the, the experiment. So the idea would be that you put water in the ground, you store it, and then you pump it back out when you need it. But from a physical perspective, we all know that there's a hydraulic gradient everywhere, so if you inject some potable water into the ground, chances are it's not gonna be exactly where you put it when you came back. So there's questions about where this, this they call it the bubble, where the bubble of fresh water moves. There's also geochemical questions in terms of mixing, where you're taking perfectly good water. Most ASR sites are in places that have water limitation, coastal regions, brackish aquifers, and so um, there's mixing along the edges of the bubble that people are concerned about, so losing water quality. And then biologically, there's probably a ton of interesting questions that are outside of my expertise about introducing water from one site to another. So the question is like, what happens when you do this? So um, Charleston, South Carolina it has a history of hurricanes, and this uh, has an emergency water supply for um, hurricane systems. And uh, I'm gonna talk about this field site. It is a USGS research site, which made it an easy place to work. And I'm gonna show you data from a aquifer storage recovery well, shown here in blue and map view. That's the well in which we're gonna inject material and extract material. There are three observation wells very close to the injection well, all within 10 meters. Um, where uh, we were going to collect data. This is in a fractured limestone aquifer that's about 100 meters below land surface. And uh, I'm gonna show you data from two of the wells, put little stars on them, um, because the third well wasn't hydro uh, hydrologically connected. We could see that when we injected that fresh water. So I'm gonna show you data from two wells. So um, what we did is we collected data over what is probably the world's shortest aquifer storage recovery experiment. We injected water for five days, we stored it for two days, and then we pulled it out over four days. Generally, ASR experiments would be seasonal, but it turns out uh, doing field work in Charleston, South Carolina, which is incredibly hot, it has mosquitoes like bats, this is as long as the graduate students were willing to commit. Um, so we're gonna put that, that fresh water into a brackish aquifer, store it, pump it back out, and then we are also gonna install some geophysical electrodes down those three wells we talked about so we can take a look at that has changed as a bulk conductivity. So what I'm showing you here is bulk conductivity through time for those two observation wells that were hydrologically connected. I'm using those little icons of the, the red and the blue two porosity piece to indicate that I think the geophysical measurements are sensitive to both that mobile and less mobile pore space. What you see in this um, data set is nothing surprising. You inject fresh water into a brackish aquifer, it becomes less conductive and then you see that decrease in conductivity, we store it and we pump it back out. So there's nothing within this data set that is particularly exciting. This is collected between four electrodes straddling the fracture zone. But if we take a look at the fluid measurements that were taken at the same location, we see something a little bit different. So when we turn the pump off, we see that rebound in concentration, the same one we were talking about in both wells. So we see a rebound in concentration that probably happens when the system is no longer so advective, the pumps aren't on and moving that water quickly, 
that salty water has the opportunity to move out of that less mobile pore space and get into the, the more connected pore space, which we measure with the pedometer. So um, if we look at those data sets against one another, bulk and fluid conductivities, what we find is that they don't look like a straight line. There's actually a hysteresis between them. And all the hysteresis tells you is that there's some sort of lag in timing from one, one parameter to another, one behavior to another. So we know these things aren't changing at the same time. So the hypothesis was this. We thought, well, what's probably happening is we're injecting that fresh water into this salty aquifer. And what's happening is that that fresh water displaces all of the salty water that's in that well-connected pore space. So our fluid conductivities decrease. But there are still less mobile pores, where stuff is trapped, um, that hasn't had that chance for that fresh water to come in and displace that void. So our, um, our bulk conductivity is, is still comparatively high. The exciting part happens when we store the water, we turn off the pump, the system is no longer so advective, and that salty water that's in that less mobile pore space diffuses back out into the mobile, um, the mobile pore space and leads to that rebound in concentration. But we see nothing in the geophysics because as far as it was concerned, that mass was always there. It was always electrically connected, and so that mobile and immobile pore space doesn't really exist from an electrical perspective, so you see no change. And then we pump that water out, so we remove whatever's in the subsurface. So it's an interesting hypothesis, but a good way to test this would be with a model. So that's what we did. So what I'm showing you here is a really simple model. This is a 1D radial model made in ModFlow and MT3D coupled to an electrical model. So what I'm showing you on the left-hand panel is the simulated electrical data. The middle panel is the simulated concentration data or fluid conductivity data. And on the far right panel is the hysteresis between the two. Now this is not a perfect fit to our data because it's a 1D model, but the idea was to get the behavior correct. So what I wanted to do was take a look at those two unknown parameters that were within that dual domain mass transfer model, that less mobile porosity and that mass transfer rate, to see if we could constrain them by having these data sets. So here's a base case scenario. And so what I wanted to know is what happens if we change that, that mass transfer rate, how fast stuff can move back and forth between the mobile and less mobile pore space. So if we turn that thing up by an order of magnitude, we turn that mass transfer rate up, and stuff can move back and forth really quickly, what you find is that in both of those two left-hand panels, they start to look like one another. And that's because if stuff can move really quickly between the two domains, there's effectively no immobile or less mobile pore space anymore. So these two things, the bulk conductivity measuring the geophysics sensitive to everything, and those fluid conductivities start to look like one another, that far right image starts to collapse towards a straight line, that hysteresis as predicted by Oakley's law, because there's no longer really an immobile pore space if that mass transfer rate is too low. We could do the same thing, or too high, we could turn down the mass transfer rate by an order of magnitude from the base case as shown here in red, and, um, and what you see is most obvious, in the, again, in the far right panel, that hysteresis curve is also collapsing to a straight line, but one with a different slope. And the reason for that is that if the mass transfer rate is really slow, it's almost like it's a single domain system again. There's not enough time for that solute to make its way in or out of that less mobile pore space. And so what you're seeing is basically a single domain system, but only where the connected porosity matters. And so what's cool about this is we're starting to be able to, to get a feel for these parameters that are hard for us to measure by having these two data sets. And we could do the same thing with immobile porosity. We could come back to that base case data set and we could say, all right, well, what if we have a much bigger or smaller, less mobile porosity? How would that have changed the data I collected in the field? If I turn up, um, or sorry, turn down the less mobile porosity, what I find is that on the far right-hand side, that hysteresis curve is collapsing to a straight line again because there's less storage. If you have less immobile pore space, there's less places to store material. It's more like a single domain system. If I turn the mass transfer rate up, I see the opposite thing, right, which is that that hysteresis is getting bigger. There's more places to store solute in the subsurface. So who cares, right? So the whole idea of this is that what we're trying to be able to do is make predictions that allow us to quantify things like rebound and pump and tra treat systems. Or if you're a hydrogeologist that thinks about watershed um, age of waters, um, this is also an important process. You wanna know what's there in terms of that less mobile pore space so you don't bias your solutions young by not knowing that it's there. So we're trying to get a sense for how stuff moves in the subsurface. 
And from the models that I just showed you, we have, can wave our hands basically at the mass transfer rate alpha and that less mobile core space. But it would be nice to be able to estimate these things directly rather than waving our hands at them through a modeling exercise. So that's what we're gonna do now. So um, the way we decided we should take a look at this is through a moment analysis. And if you think about moments, all they do is describe the properties of a distribution. So if we have a concentration history, we can think of that as a, a distribution in which we would like to calculate moments. And so moments look at things like the area under the curve, which in this case would tell you about the mass that's migrating past some location. They'll find the mean median value for you, which in this case would tell you about the advective processes in the system. They also will tell you about the spread on your distribution, which in this case tell you about dispersion and diffusion. And there's higher order moments that allow you to explain the skewness and the kurtosis, et cetera. What's cool about this is that if you can calculate moments on your concentration histories, you can talk about hydrologic process. And what's also cool is that calculating a moment is really easy. All this equation says at the bottom is that if I wanna know something about the moments of my distribution, I need one, one data set, and that's a concentration history. C is a function of T. We're super good at measuring concentration histories. All we need is a well to do that. So if I have one set of data through time and one well, I can calculate temporal moments. So um, the reason I wanted to calculate temporal moments is I found this equation in the literature. Charlie Harvey, who's at MIT, had published this. And, um, and it's actually a super cool equation. So what it says is that if you know two things, those temporal moments in the connected pore space and those temporal moments in the less connected pore space, then you can estimate things like alpha through algebra. The problem with this equation is this. It's that this term, that less mobile pore space concentration history, is the dotted line that we, we showed earlier. We don't have a way of measuring that particularly. Like that's the part where, where we get stuck. We're really good at measuring concentration histories of connected pore space. But it's that less connected pore space piece that's problematic. And so I'd love to use this equation, but I'm missing a really important piece, the concentration history and the immobile pore space. So then I can't estimate alpha. So my um, colleague Fred Day-Lewis and I at the USGS spent some time thinking about this equation and rewriting it in terms of a concentration history based on the geophysics. So taking that left-hand term and converting it into something that measures a composite mobile, immobile pore space together. I'm gonna spare you that equation because it's even uglier than this one, but it looks similar. So what we did is we wanted to test whether or not that equation worked. Could we use this idea of temporal moments to estimate things like alpha? So we started with a synthetic experiment. What I'm showing you here is a, a column that is saline saturated synthetic. We're gonna push through fresh water, kind of like an aquifer storage recovery experiment. Along this column, you see that the mesh finds up in a bunch of locations. At each of those locations is where we pulled samples for the concentration histories and also had electrodes where we did the geophysics. And what we assumed in this model is that there was a mass transfer rate alpha that changed up the column. So we basically broke the column into thirds and had three different mass transfer rates as we went up the column. And um, oh, the box there is also heterogeneous alpha, assuming a heterogeneous alpha. So what we found was that, yeah, if we assumed a mass transfer rate that changed along the column, that we could estimate it with an equation very similar to the one in the last slide. But it's a synthetic, and you can do lots of things in a synthetic. And so we wanted to make sure that it's actually held um, to experimental data as well. So we went into the lab. Um, as a simple place, and we did a number of experiments with different materials in the lab, and so we basically mimicked the experiment that you saw on the last slide, um, where rather than having a synthetic column, we now just have a real one, and we are going to wire it up so we can measure geophysics and pull concentration samples, and that's what that image is on the right-hand side. You can see a small column labeled there um, that says packed column with electrodes, and we packed it full of a whole bunch of different things, and I'm gonna show you just two data sets because they represent good end members. I'm gonna show you AccuSand, which is 99.9% .9 quartz sand. It's the closest thing to glass beads that you can use and still call yourself a geologist. It is, um, it is gonna be our control because we would not expect to see less mobile pore space in a column that's packed full of effectively glass beads. The other material I'm gonna show you is a zeolite. And a zeolite is a volcanic material with a known internal porosity. It's a great um, set of materials to use for um, mobile and mobile experiments because if you pack a column full of crushed up zeolite, you have a lot of internal porosity and then you also have the uh, intergranular porosity. So you have an intra, intergranular porosity. So what we found in these experiments was this. So as we moved that fresh water through these saline saturated 
systems, we could estimate things like that mass transfer rate and that less mobile porosity. And if you look at the top in the AccuSand, what you can find is we're really sensitive to the amount of connected porosity there is, 35-ish percent, which is what you would expect from a sand-packed column. You're completely insensitive to the less mobile porosity because there really isn't any. Probably a little bit of experimental error in assuming 1D flow in a column where we work very hard to have 1D flow, but there's probably uh, issues around the edge. We do measure a tiny, tiny mass transfer rate, um, which is five orders of magnitude smaller than what we see in the zeolite. When we look down at the zeolite, we see that we have a much faster alpha, much faster mass transfer rate, and that we can um, map out both the mobile and the less mobile component. So again, these are the parameters we need for these models, um, and we can do that through these experiments. So um, since that time, Marty Briggs, who's at the USGS, has, has taken this idea of looking at those hysteresis curves we were talking about and came up with a graphical, analytical um, method for estimating mass transfer rates um, from those hysteresis curves, as well as here beta is just the ratio of the mobile to the immobile porosity. So people have been pushing this since, but again, the idea of being able to measure this stuff um, before you're in the field if you can. Um, for the last little bit of this talk, I just wanna take us to a different system, because this idea of mobile and mobile is actually really important to things just beyond groundwater hydrology. It turns out that these are the same equations that people use to like map blood in vascular systems of pigs, that we use to look at water moving through leaves, um, that we see similar mathematics in lots of different places within the planet. And I wanna take us to another earth system, since that's what I do and what we do. Um, I'm gonna take us to surface water groundwater systems. So I'm gonna take a look at how streams communicate with the aquifers around them. And I'm gonna talk about the hyperreic zone, where this is a sort of hot area of research over the last couple of decades in hydrogeology, um, where hyperreic comes from two Greek roots, hypos meaning below, and rios meaning flow. And it's the idea, it's the part of the river corridor where surface water becomes groundwater and then comes back to being surface water. And that can either happen through the base of the stream, which is the, where hyperreic came from in its root, or even through, um, through the side, right? So where we can have like a, a curving river and that, that material leaves the river, goes through the aquifer and comes back in and maps to you. Now part of the reason the hyperreic zone is really interesting is when we think about all the good things that rivers do for us, like thermal buffering for fish refugia, denitrification, metal uptake, all of these things happen because surface water goes into groundwater, lengthening the residence time on which that material is in the Earth system. That little corridor is a bacterial hotspot. There's really high gradients in things like dissolved oxygen and organic matter. And so those bacteria have an opportunity to act on contaminants that might be in that space. Groundwater is also usually cold year round, so that provides that thermal buffering. This area is so important, this hyperreic zone, that it's been called a river's liver. And so, um, so we're gonna take a look at the mathematics that people use to describe transport through that river. Now, if you are interested in hyperreic zone processes, um, it turns out that what you normally do is you and your buddy get a you know, gigantic tank of dye, you dump it in the stream, and you measure what the concentration history looks like down gradient. And ideally, just like in the groundwater case, you would have something that's almost Gaussian if you take a look at it down gradient. But what we see in most systems is a really long tail just like we do in groundwater systems. And that's because that solute is getting stuck in less mobile pore space. In this case, in this case the uh, hyperreic zone, eddies on the surface, et cetera. If I wanna know the extent of the hyperreic zone, um, I would usually fit that area to this data set. So just like in the groundwater system, there's gonna be two important parameters for hyperreic zone studies. Alpha, the mass transfer rate of solutes between the stream and the hyperreic zone. And instead of an immobile porosity, the area of the hyperreic zone, but it's the exact same idea. If I wanna know how big a hyperreic zone is, my best option is aquifer acupuncture or fitting it to those data sets that we have, um, these concentration histories. And so, um, so we struggle sometimes for figuring out exactly how, how big is that zone where the work is being done. So um, Mike Youssef, who's now at the University of Colorado and I, when we were both still at Penn State, we're talking about how important that hyperreic zone is to a lot of ecosystem services. And the question is how big is that zone and how does it change seasonally? So if all the work is happening in that hyperreic um, pathway, then we wanna have a sense of how big that thing is and how it changes through time. And so what we thought might happen is that during times of high base flow, so times when water tables are high, think about spring months, that high water table is gonna drive water into the stream. And what we thought was, well, maybe those high water tables will compress that stream, compress that hyperreic zone, 
because the, the pressures from that would squeeze that little stream such that maybe our hyperreic zones would be smaller in the spring than they would be in, say, fall months where the water table is relaxed and have less driving hydraulic head, less driving pressure into the stream. And that's what the diagram at the bottom is trying to show is the arrows are indicating what we thought the size of the hyperreic zone might be. I ripped this right out of the proposal that we had funded by the NSF. Um, and what we wanted to know to, to answer this is we were gonna have to map how big that hyperreic zone was. So um, to do this, we're gonna have to estimate um, electrical conductivities again, but this time we're gonna do something a little different, which is an inverse problem. We're gonna need to actually make maps of electrical conductivity because in groundwater, the mobile and immobile zones overlap. They're effectively in the same place. In a stream system, they don't because you have a stream that's mobile and the hyperreic zone is around it, so they don't overlap in space. So we need to actually make an image of the conductivity using, using an inversion. So the way that that works, I'm sure many people here are very good at inversion, um, the idea is that we're gonna collect those resistance measurements in the field that we talked about before. This is an image, all those black dots are resistance measurements in depth and distance, distance and depth. And um, these are the measurements that are made in the field. What we'd like to be able to do is make a map of the subsurface electrical conductivity that fits these field observations. So the idea would be to simulate resistance measurements using a model that look like what we see in the field and what would the electrical conductivity map of the subsurface look like um, that would allow that to happen. So that bottom image is our inverted map of the electrical conductivity of the subsurface. It predicts the data um, that are just above it in the second panel. So those are simulated data and we're gonna compare those to our field observations. If the first two images look like one another, we're gonna say, well, that third image must at least explain some of what we see in the, sur the subsurface system. So it's inversion in one slide. Another thing to keep in mind is that when we invert data, um, the state of the practice is, in, at least in geophysics, which is a little different than hydrogeology, is to over-parameterize the inverse problem, meaning we're solving for more conductivity unknowns than we have data. And so what that means is that in order to come up with a unique solution, we tend to smooth stuff out quite a bit. We minimize roughness. And so what that means is that this is a synthetic example showing you um, an assumed electrical conductivity and what we get back out of inversions. And what this means is that estimating things like areas and volumes can be quite hard because we kind of have the beer goggles version of the subsurface. You're gonna see the high values underestimated and the low values overestimated. So keep that in mind as I show you these images. So I'm gonna take us to Oregon, um, so to the northwestern part of the US, a uh, very Mediterranean climate. We are gonna do a series of saline tracer tests within a watershed here known as Watershed 3. This is a long-term uh, forest um, hydrology forestry research site. So, um, so here's watershed three in map view. Contrary to everything they tell you to do in a map, flow is going left and up in this uh, image. And um, the reason we wanted to work in watershed three was in part is that all the little red dots you see are piezometers. So someone has already put wells in the system. If you have tried to drill wells by hand into a rocky stream bed, you know how excited you are when someone else has done it for you. So this is part of the reason we worked at the site. What we uh, did install are all the yellow plus signs, which are electrodes that we use for the geophysics to estimate the conductivity of the subsurface. We have six transects where we were trying to measure the electrical conductivity. One of them is not highlighted because we were never able to get those data to invert. If you take a look at the location of the electrodes in this, this map view cartoon, you'll see that a bunch of those electrodes are on rocks and it's very hard to drive current into rock, and so it turns out that, that um, the quality of the data collected on that line weren't so good. For today's talk, I'm just gonna focus on the flashing line, and the reason for that is it's actually at a really interesting part within the watershed. Um, the upper part of the watershed is really steep and narrow. This is all, all sitting on an andesite, um, and so there's not a lot of hyperreic exchange because there's not a lot of fluvial material for that solute to get into, so it's basically a bedrock confined channel, and just above that line, it opens out flatter, it's got a lot more fluvial material, and there's a much more developed hyperreic zone. So what I'm gonna show you are um, tracer tests conducted um, over four different times during base flow recession, basically during the time that water tables are dropping. And, um, and you can see in yellow the discharge of the stream. You can see that it, um, in Oregon there's a lot of rain um, up until June, and then things just tend to calm down and you see this very dry summer there. So I'm gonna show you data from four um, different experiments within the stream. Now, if you're not used to thinking about stream discharges, these are really small. This is a stream that starts out sort of knee deep and then sort of two meters across. This is a pretty small stream. And part of the reason we're working in such small streams is that when you think about the size of that hyperreic zone, if here's my river, that hyperreic zone 
is a really big area for a small stream when you compare it to a really big stream. The wetted perimeter, if you just think of it that way, of a really big stream is pretty small. So conventional thought is that a lot of the work that happens within stream systems is happening in the small stream. And so that's why we're looking at something so small. So what I'm showing you here are three um, of the four data sets that we collected, the 15 liter per second case is missing. Um, just because in the um, field we ended up injecting a bunch more salt, which happens when you're in the field. And, um, and while quantitatively it makes no difference, qualitatively us looking at the pictures is a little distracting, so I just pulled that data set out. What you see here are three inversions, so these are depth and distance. Um, looking across that stream, you can see how small it is when you look at it now, um, at the, the highest discharge case on the left. Now what you're seeing is a, a change in electrical conductivity. These are different inversions from a background data set before the tracer was injected. What you see in each of these cases is as we start to inject salt into the stream, the stream itself lights up, it becomes more electrically conductive. So as we move forward in this experiment, six hours, 12 hours, 24, 48 hours into a 48 hour experiment, what you can see in each of these cases is that the stream itself is bright blue. As you start injecting salt, it gets really salty in the stream. But what's also cool is all of the area around the stream that's lit up. So what we basically have here is all that hyperreic zone is lighting up. You can see all the salt that's around the stream itself, which is bounded again by blue um, in all three of these cases. And it's most clear if we come back six hours after the end of injection, especially in the high discharge case where the stream is the largest, what you can see is that the stream conductivities are back down to a background condition, but you see this sort of bathtub ring of salt that remains around the stream. Again, we're imaging that hyperreic zone, which is the thing we didn't quite know how to do without punching a bunch of holes in the ground. So this is the first time anyone had tried to do this. And then if we come back 24 hours later, we see that most of that salt is gone. So what's cool about this, again, is this idea that geophysics can help contribute to our understanding of, of transport characteristics by measuring some pieces that are really important. In this case, we're estimating area of the hyperreic zone. We can estimate things like alpha, that mass transfer rate, um, and get a sense for resonance times as well. One thing I should point out is that this hypothesis was flat wrong. So if you take a look at it, what you'll find is that at higher discharge, if anything, we see a hyperreic zone that looks a little bigger. And uh, I show this because I think it's good to show bad hypotheses too. Um, what we forgot about is we had a very groundwater hydrology perspective on this when we thought about it, which is we thought all about the water table and how it acted on the stream. We drew something right in this image that we didn't think about entirely, and that's that the stream is also bigger in the early season. And so there's also a stream pushing back out on the aquifer. And so um, in retrospect, it was a slightly naive assumption, but it was worth testing. So, um, so that's today's talk. So what I'm hoping I can um, convey to you is that there's some really interesting things happening within the groundwater community in terms of trying to understand solute transport processes and the mathematics that we use to describe that. This mobile immobile or dual domain model is one of the simplest of those. But what I like about it is it has parameters that are things that I think we can measure. And then I think geophysics has a role to play in that. And so if we're trying to come up with better ways of estimating contaminant transport behavior, um, exploring some of these models and some of the additional data that come with it could be really interesting and really useful. Um, and so that's that. So um, there's a bunch of papers here. We've published a lot on this over the last 10 years. Some of them are here if you're interested. And um, thank you for your time and attention. Have maybe one or two minutes for quick questions for Kamini. Oh, please, thanks. Yeah, super important question because, um, and just in general, conductivity is really sense. Sorry, those, those lights are like super, super bright. Um, the the um, conductivity is really strongly impacted. Right. So for all of the measurements that we made here, for the, gr the deeper groundwater system, for the aquifer storage recovery system, the temperature doesn't vary a ton with depth, but for the stream system, it's really important. So we end up using eye buttons to measure temperature both within the stream and in the stream bed um, so that we can correct the geophysical images in terms of temperature. So that's a really important part of that study. For the deeper stuff, it's less important, but for the streams, you're, you're bang on. Temperature is a, is a key component. We see diol variations in conductivity just as a function of temperature. Well, if anyone else wants to talk to me, I am here all day, and I would be more than happy to chat with anyone who's interested. So, Kamini, 
never disappointing to hear you speak. Um, it was an excellent lecture, and I think just as excellent as the first one that you did, so I don't know whether you improved or not. <laughs> On behalf of the Canadian Geotechnical Society and the Canadian National Chapter of the IAH, thank you very much for doing the Darcy Lecture here today. <laughs>